Thank you. I'd like to begin by saying that my 18-year-old self would be horrified to know that I'm speaking in chapel today. While I was a student at Brooks, I had no intention of ever speaking in chapel, despite the numerous opportunities provided for students to do so. In fact, it seemed that there were so many opportunities to formally address the community that I actually found myself avoiding them quite often. My sophomore year, a few of my friends suggested that I sign up for the Wilder Speaking Prize, and I said, not a chance. At the end of my junior year, I was sitting in my advisor, Ms. Chanel's office, looking at the course catalog to select my classes for the following year. She suggested that I consider taking Mr. McVeigh's oratory class, and I suggested that I not consider taking Mr. McVeigh's oratory class. My senior spring, when our school chaplain, Mr. Flanders, sent out an email to the sixth form asking if anyone would be interested in giving a speech, I deleted that email as soon as it arrived in my inbox. So by the time I graduated Brooks, I was quite pleased with myself for successfully closing the door on every opportunity that had presented itself to give a chapel talk. But when I got an email from Ms. Churchill at the beginning of April asking if I had any interest in speaking in chapel for Kippy Little Day, I said yes. And now here I am somehow a few years later, back in this chapel, doing exactly what I was not trying to do the last time I was here. And it is specifically because of my relationship to athletics and to rowing in particular, that I was able to say yes to speaking in chapel today. Rowing is and has been my sport for the past 10 years. I learned to row here at Brooks and since then, I've been sure to make room for this sport in my life. There are so many things that I admire about rowing. And many of the things that I find appealing about this sport are shared across the entire rowing community. I like to get up early. I like to be outside. I like to engage in physically and mentally demanding activities. I like water. I like to follow directions. I like to be challenged. I like to compete. And I like to be held accountable. And while I have a deep affection for crew for all of the aforementioned reasons, there are two immensely valuable lessons that this sport has taught me in the years that I've dedicated to practicing it. The first lesson I learned was how to fully commit myself to being part of a collective goal. I learned what this felt like from my relationship with my teammate, Allison, who is my friend, my roommate, and also my number one rival. Throughout our entire collegiate rowing career, Allison and I were constantly pitted against each other. We seat raced each other more than anyone else on the team seat raced at all. Every year, the two of us went head to head for the same spot in any given boat. Our freshman year, we competed for stroke seat of the second varsity boat. I won. Sophomore year, we fought for four seat of the first boat in the fall and for three seat in the spring. She won in the fall and I won in the spring. In our senior year, when I got back from studying abroad, we battled it out for stroke seat of the first varsity boat and she won. Allison and I are both very competitive people. And as a result of this, we both strongly prefer winning to losing. However, in a seat race, only one of us could win. It didn't take us long to realize that sharing a room with the person who you've just replaced or been replaced by can be pretty uncomfortable. But it also didn't take us very long to abandon this discomfort by reframing our focus from ourselves as individuals to the goal of the collective team, which was to be fast and to win. We understood that the driving force behind our constant competition was to make the team better. We trusted that our individual placements would contribute to the collective goal. And that trust and commitment to the collective and not to ourselves is what allowed us to maintain a wonderful friendship in the midst of all the competition. So ultimately, it didn't matter where one of us was in relation to the other, so long as we did our part in contributing to the collective goal. But that's not to say that I wasn't upset when I lost a seat race to her. I'm still competitive and I like to win. The second lesson that rowing has taught me goes hand in hand with the first, and that has been the ability to practice compassion for my teammates, for my friends and family, and for myself. I've learned that practicing compassion requires acknowledging that any group of people whether it be a boat, a team, a dorm, or a school community, 
Any group of people is composed of a collection of individuals with different backgrounds, experiences, values, and needs that go beyond whatever it is that brings them all together. And it is so important that in our efforts to achieve a collective goal, we do not erase, overlook, or discount the individuality of those who are committed to that effort. I'll return to the context of rowing to give a further explanation. Something that I've often heard coaches say, especially if someone is having a bad day, is leave it on the dock. The intent behind this phrase is to get rowers to put out of their minds anything that is troubling them before they get in their boat in order to focus only on rowing without any distractions. I don't like this saying because it fails to implement compassion for the different experiences and needs of every team member. Instead, it labels these aspects of their identities as distractions or obstacles that are in the way of achieving the collective goal. So then what does it look like to shift gears and transition away from viewing different needs, identities, and experiences as obstacles? I'll bring back my rival roommate, Allison, to give you another example. Allison has type A diabetes, and therefore her body's needs were different from the needs of mine and others. Oftentimes we had to stop in the middle of practice so that she could monitor her blood sugar, take insulin, or eat something. To look at Allison's diabetes as an obstacle to our collective goal would be to view our practice as interrupted, delayed, or inefficient as a result of her diabetes. To look at it with compassion would be to say instead that practice successfully met everyone's needs, not just the needs of the non-diabetic bodies, and allowed everyone to safely participate and move together towards our collective goal of being a fast team. Instead of viewing Allison's diabetes as an obstacle to the team's productivity, we chose to view the team's practices as an obstacle to Allison's productivity. And as a result, our approach to practice changed, which allowed her to be able to fully contribute to our collective goal and for us as a program to become better and faster because of it. So then in thinking about our own community, these differences, these characteristics that make us each who we are, are not weaknesses or distractions from our collective goals. We cannot snub out or ignore these parts of ourselves because they make up the very bodies that are alive and able to do whatever it is that we want them to do, whether that be rowing, speaking, singing, learning, dancing, teaching, etc. The idea that we should, or are even capable of, leaving things on the dock suggests that people need to repress parts of themselves or their experiences in order to be successful or effective. It suggests that individuality, that difference, is a weakness or a hindrance to achieving a collective goal. If at Brooks, any individual is unable to fully be themselves, then we have fallen short in our collective effort to create the kind of community that we strive to have. I have found that whenever I am asked to repress parts of myself for the comfort or convenience of other people, I am incapable of performing to my, fullish, my fullest potential. I'm speaking to you all today because when I was a student at Brooks, I hid parts of myself and I only revealed what I thought those who surrounded me would find appealing. For four years, I guarded myself in the classroom, at practice, and in the dorm. And for four years, I turned down every opportunity to give a chapel talk because I, feel, I feared that my community wouldn't like what I had to say. Now looking back on the many ways in which I hid parts of myself from teachers, from coaches, and from friends, I feel anger and I feel compassion. I feel anger and compassion for my teenage self and for every member of this community, student or adult, who hasn't felt like they can be themselves here. So now having shared all of this with you, I ask you to consider the following questions. What does success look like in our community? Are you able to be your full self in this community? What can you do as an individual to play an active role in contributing to making this a place where every person can be their full self? Now I know this is the first time you've gotten these questions, but I've been pondering them for a while. So let me tell you what I think. Just as my crew team rejected the idea that Allison being a diabetic was an obstacle to our collective goal, we have to discard of the idea that we are unable to make room in our community 
for people who don't look, speak, learn, move, or think like we do. I think that feeling full belonging to my community is a right and not a privilege. I think that a successful community elevates all of its members and respects, embraces, and protects everyone's individual needs and differences. I think that embodying and acting upon what I believe in is necessary in order to have compassion for myself and for my community. I'll conclude by inviting you all to take action on your own thoughts with a little help of a, from a quote from activist and poet Sonia Renee Taylor. She says, being intimately connected to our thoughts is not enough to change our behaviors. Knowing why we do something will not necessarily keep us from doing it. Doing is a choice. It is an act of will. Doing often demands that we act despite our thoughts. In my time as a student at Brooks, I was intimately connected with my thoughts, but I was very hesitant to transition from thinking to doing. Since then, I feel so fortunate to have been able to graduate from thinking to doing, and ultimately, I credit this transition to all the years I've spent as a rower. It was with my teammates in boats and on ergs and on buses and in weight rooms that I learned to be an active community member, to practice compassion, to embody my values, and to speak about what I believe is important. And I know that by doing and not thinking these things, I am bettering myself and the communities that I am a part of. All in all, I could never have predicted just how many gifts athletics was going to give me in the first 24 years of my life. But of all that I've gained from it, today I feel most grateful that it's allowed me to finally share myself with all of you. Thank you.